Again, thank you, Tim. If you would go ahead and open your Bibles to the Gospel of John. John chapters 18 and 19. We will read uh, beginning in chapter, uh, in verse 1 of chapter 18 and read through verses 11 here in just a moment. Again, our first portion of text shall be John 18 verses 1 through 11. I'll remind you we're in the midst of a, a fairly extensive, I think this is the going to be the longest Easter sermon series that, that I have uh, preached. And so I, I have, have enjoyed it. Uh, I think that it's uh, uh, been a, a good time of study for me, and I hope that it's been uh, a, a good time uh, for you to, to reflect upon the great reality of uh, the very purpose for which Jesus uh, came into uh, our world, in which he suffered all of the things that are associated with fallen humanity, but yet he did not sin, and he was the sinless Lamb of God who hung on the cross for our salvation. And so I've called the series Triumph Through Tragedy. Uh, was it tragic that Jesus was rejected and ultimately crucified? Is it tragic that uh, people still uh, reject the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes, indeed it is. But there is indeed a triumph in this tragedy. That This was a path that had been ordained before all worlds were created, that the Son would walk, accomplishing the will of the Father, uh, the redemption of the bride that had been given to Him in eternity past. And He would accomplish this through the shedding of His blood, and this great truth would be applied as the gospel is preached through the ministry, the work, the presence of the Holy Spirit, in which He would work through these means to bring people to a saving knowledge of the Son of God. Again, the crucified Lamb of God. And so we look at the betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion of Jesus. I have a, a subtitle actually to that. Uh, the murder of Jesus. In which if there was ever a miscarriage of justice on the face of the earth, uh, this would be that great uh, miscarriage. This would be uh, uh, where even legitimately ordained authority, such as the Roman government, uh, they, uh, again, betrayed the trust given to them in that they murdered one who was innocent on all charges. So read with me, if you will, beginning in chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now, Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priest, and uh, the Pharisees went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they, they drew back and fell to the ground. And so he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he has spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut it off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Once again, pray with me. Father, again, we thank you for your truth. Uh, we thank you for the power of your gospel. I pray, God, that your spirit would be at work among us today. Lord, I truly can do nothing, but you can do all things. And so I would ask that you bless the reading and the study and the proclamation of your word, that you would use it to the saving of many, that you would use it to the encouragement of many, and that you would be glorified in all things. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Again, we come to this portion of Scripture. Uh, Jesus has taken his uh, small band of followers, these 11 remaining disciples. They have exited uh, this upper room and they have left uh, Jerusalem, uh, traveled a short way uh, down through a, a valley and uh, kind of a wet water creek known as the Kidron and entered into uh, this garden. Uh, this garden was a place that uh, Jesus had frequented. Uh, they may have even been spending their nights uh, there, uh, kind of camped out. And so uh, uh, they went there and Judas was familiar uh, with it. And so one thing that, that we need to, to see is that Jesus very self-consciously went to the place where that which was appointed for him would be accomplished according to God's timetable. And so we see, first of all, the, the treachery in the garden. Treachery. You know, I suppose the most notorious characters, the most notorious people in history and in fiction are those that have betrayed a sacred trust. I suppose the most infamous name in all of American history is Benedict Arnold. Uh, the one who betrayed his contemporaries uh, to the British back in the Revolutionary War. We can uh, think of, of others, uh, spies and the, and the like, the Rosenbergs and Aldrich Ames and other names of more contemporary uh, history. We, we think of Brutus, the one who betrayed uh, Caesar. And on and on it goes. And so nothing is more offensive than one who by means of treachery betrays a trust and so we find that this Judas is one that had been invited into the very inner circle of our Lord Jesus Christ had the privilege of of hearing and seeing the very uh, reality of God incarnate and yet he persisted in his hardness of heart he persisted in his rebellion and so Judas uh, comes to this familiar place intent upon carrying out uh, this great act of treachery. In a sense, it's, it's, it's a very much a model for what we call apostasy. If you remember at the, uh, the Last Supper, uh, the disciples at least had the good sense to ask the question of Jesus, is, is it me? Is it me? At least in that mo moment of self-examination, they understood how frail they were. But... Judas was the one that had been appointed and been designated and been uh, prophesied in the Word of God that he would be the one who was betrayed. And certainly uh, the relationship between God's sovereignty and Judas' actions in, in so many ways are a mystery to us. Uh, I often say that you'll never get the, the handful of sermon illustrations that I have. I'm not much of an illustrator. Uh, but if you don't know 70s rock music, if you don't know Andy Griffith, if you don't know the television show MASH, uh, then you're probably not going to get most of my illustrations. And so I'm thankful for Google that you can Google all these uh, very vague illusions. But there's an episode of the old television show MASH entitled Quo Vadis, in which a man named Captain Chandler uh, is uh, a shell-shocked uh, patient there in the MASH hospital and he is deluded into thinking that he's actually Jesus Christ. And so Father Mulcahy uh, sits down to interview uh, this man and begins to ask about Judas. And the man's answer was, Judas, he could only do what Judas was supposed to do. And that was a very kind of machinastic, very mechanical way of seeing uh, Judas as he could only do that which he was uh, determined to do or what he was designed to do or whatever. Uh, but there is a great mystery in the interaction between uh, human freedom and human will and the sovereignty of God. It is something that we will never penetrate in this life. Is God sovereign over all things? Yes, indeed he is. Was Judas rightly and justly responsible for his actions? Yes, he was. It's he is always a sobering lesson to those of us that uh, feel like we're very close to the Savior, that we, we're students of the Word, that we're faithful to the church. And yet how easy it is to 
be and do all of those things and yet never fully close with the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation he freely, freely gives. Hebrews 6 warns us about those who taste the goodness of God. Those that, that really get a, a sense of what salvation truly is and then yet eventually they fall away. He says it's impossible to renew those to repentance. Again, very sobering words, as I've mentioned a number of times in the last few weeks. I believe our salvation is secure, not because of our goodness, but because of the goodness and faithfulness of God. But yet we need to take these varied, sobering warnings and examples of Scripture that we remain faithful, that we persevere because God is preserving us until the appointed end. And so we see that Judas carries out his betrayal there and he has gone and he has sold his soul for this uh, mere 20 uh, silver coins and he goes and he returns with a band of soldiers and probably a fairly large band of soldiers uh, 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 I think the term in, in, in Latin and Greek is a cohort uh, probably it wasn't the full 600 uh, men of a cohort but it was probably a significant number that would come and accompany uh, Judas and these uh, various religious uh, officials uh, into this garden for the purpose of arresting uh, Jesus Christ. It's interesting, they do it by cover of darkness, and John is always interested in the, the, the interplay between light and dark. This great, treacherous, and evil act is carried out under the veil of darkness. And we're told that, that they came... Uh, carrying uh, lanterns and lanterns and torches and the like uh, to light the way, and uh, they even are armed so that they may take Jesus by force if that is necessary. And so when they come, and uh, we know by other accounts that Judas explains, now you're going to know who is the right one because I'm going to go up. I'm going to give him this kiss on the cheek, which was not an unusual thing uh, for people to do. Uh, in the ancient world. It was not, not uncust, uncustomary. So Jesus, uh, Judas goes and he identifies Jesus. There in verse 4, we, we see this encounter with these arresting officers. Jesus speaks directly to them. We're told in verse 4 of our text, Jesus knowing all that would happen to him. Again, nothing is happening by accident. Everything is happening according to a plan uh, by which uh, he would... Uh, go to the cross for the very purpose that he entered the world uh, to accomplish. And they tell him, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth. We're, we're seeking this one particular individual. And Jesus' response is the, translated into English, I am he. And we're told that, that, the, that those who uh, heard him, Judas included, uh, were just they fell back. And uh, one of the significant mileposts in the Gospel of John, is what's called the I am uh, statements. And uh, usually we count them as seven I am statements of John. But you could very well include this as an eight. In that, uh, I don't know what exactly happened. Maybe it was the sheer boldness of Jesus, that he didn't try to run. That he, instead of stepping back and trying to hide, he stepped forward to meet his arresters, his accusers. And he simply says to them, I am am he and they fall back and fall backwards at the power of the revelation of the name of God himself and so Jesus again again when they kind of recover uh, the, their senses in verse 7 they ask him again or he asked them and, and they, they said well Jesus of Nazareth again I told you I've already told you who, who I am I'm the one that you seek and if you're looking for me then you let the rest of these men go. Your, your problem is with me, not with them. And so again, Jesus the great intercessor, even at this point. And so we're told that Jesus indeed uh, was uh, fulfilling Scripture by, by assuring that he would not lose any of those sheep that were entrusted to him. And then uh, verse 10 tells us about this attack upon uh, the servant uh, Malchus there in the garden that, that Peter drew his sword. And it's an incredible thing that here in the midst of uh, 
kind of a posse, we might say, a, a, a large contingent of soldiers sent for the purpose of arresting Jesus, that Peter conjures this type of, um, of courage to, to draw the sword and, 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 again, seemingly willing to die because, again, they would have been easily overwhelmed by the number and the armaments associated with those that have come to arrest Jesus. So in this moment, uh, Peter finds himself to be quite courageous. It, it, it reminds me a bit. Of, sometimes we, we say, and we're very quick to say, oh, I would die for Jesus, or I would die for the sake of the gospel. For most of us, that's not what God requires of us. He calls upon us to live for the gospel, to give testimony to that gospel. And so when the time comes, and just, just moments later, in the presence of simp a simple slave girl with no immediate threat to his life at all, the apostle Peter loses that very same courage. And he denies the Lord Jesus, just as it was said he would do. And so, again, Peter is willing to fight, he's willing to die, but we find that this uh, all too frequent weakness does uh, dominate him just as Jesus said it would at the crucial moment. And so Jesus looks at Peter, and he re after restoring the ear of the servant, Peter, it, it, we might paraphrase this way. Peter, we're in a war, we're in a battle, that is to be sure. But the weapon that you brought with you tonight to engage in a battle is not the appropriate weapon for the battle that you're assigned as a soldier to fight in. And so put that silly sword away. It is a worldly and carnal weapon that is used for an entirely different purpose, and it will be absolutely useful for you to use it in the battle that I'm assigning you to fight. And so sheathe the sword, and then Jesus simply says, Shall I not drink the cup? that the Father has given me. We see this metaphor a number of times through the Scripture. Again, Jesus uh, had just prayed in Gethsemane that um, uh, this cup, if it were possible, if it were possible, could this cup pass from me? And yet again, there was no other way for God to be holy and just and right and at the same time be gracious and merciful towards sinners, to people who deserved wrath other than by the way of the cross. By, Je by Jesus Christ drinking to its very bottom, draining it dry, the cup of God's wrath. Wrath that had the name Tim Evans right there in the middle of it. The wrath that Tim Evans deserved to receive for the entirety of eternity was poured into that cup along with the wrath ordained and designed for every sinner who would ever believe Jesus drank that and experienced that wrath on the cross at Calvary for our salvation. Let's look at the second issue here. Not only was there treachery in the garden, there was the travesty of his trials. Again, uh, chapter 18 beginning in verse 12. So, the band of soldiers and their captain and officers of, of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And first they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple, since that disciple was known to the high priest. He entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the servants and officers made a, had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching and Jesus answered him I've spoken openly to the world I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together 
I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me uh, what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, so they said to him, You are also not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once the rooster crowed. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning, and they themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And then Pilate said to him, So, you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king? For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. And so, we find upon the arrest of Jesus, they go to the uh, residence of the high priest. Uh, probably, uh, the high priest uh, at, at that uh, time was this man, Annas. Uh, he was the, the father of a uh, kind of a priestly family. And so, his sons and, he, and his son-in-law, uh, kind of shared this high priesthood and passed it from one member uh, to another. And so uh, the actual functioning high priest at this time uh, was the son-in-law, Caiaphas. And this was uh, uh, a very cruel and vicious uh, family. They were those that uh, uh, were in it for what they could gain uh, from the position. Uh, they were in collusion with the, the Roman uh, government. They had uh, kind of uh, uh, worked themselves in so that they had found favor uh, with, with Pilate so that life was uh, somewhat easy and uh, that they were not interfered with in doing uh, that which they wanted. And, of course, uh, Jesus had already ran afoul of them by cleansing the temple, by indicting them for the fact that their commerce was actually uh, uh, the engaging in the act of robbery and thievery by the very uh, things that they were selling uh, there within the temple. And then he had indicted them verbally for being a bunch of hypocrites, that, that you're simply just a whitewashed tomb. You're defiled to your very core, that, that outwardly you, you, you seem to be so religious, so spiritual, but yet, again, you are dirty and you're rotten. To your very core. And so John tells us, and John doesn't tell us everything about the, the, uh, the various trials of Jesus. In fact, if we kind of put the gospel accounts together, there were actually five uh, different trials that Jesus endured on that night. He goes to Annas first, 
uh, then to Caiaphas, then to Pilate, then to Herod, and then back to Pilate. So there are five different uh, accounts there, and John doesn't tell us about each and every uh, one of, of them. And so verses 12 through 14 tell us about this initial uh, encounter. Uh, Jesus, having been bound, is brought uh, to this place. It's early in the morning. It's still uh, dark, and they take him uh, to this uh, uh, high priest, of uh, the priestly family and uh, one that probably was the power behind uh, those that were actually carrying out the day-to-day -day activities of the, the high priest. And so we're told that he's actually Caiaphas' father-in-law, the one that would engage in a, a second trial of Jesus Christ. And we're told there in verse 14 that Caiaphas uh, is the man that stated upon seeing the raising of Lazarus from the dead, that it would be better for one man to die for the country. That, that this Jesus is such a problem that, that he is going to create a situation within the country that it's going to be a threat to our place, our position, our power. And so it's going to be better to kill him than let what he proposes to do run its course. They were felt so threatened by the power and by the authority, by the ministry of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, they go there, and we're told that, that in this occasion, uh, Peter denies Jesus uh, for uh, the first time. Uh, we're told that Peter and most likely John, the, the writer of this gospel account, uh, they go with uh, Jesus into the, uh, the residence of the high priest, and then uh, they're out in the courtyard. We're told Peter uh, goes outside, uh, John, if that's who this is, uh, goes inside because he was known uh, to the high priest and kind of on his say-so, Peter is invited uh, in, inside. And then Peter is asked by the, the girl, you're not one of his disciples, are you? Again, just a servant girl. No, no threat to a man like Peter at all. And yet what does he do? He denies Jesus. I am not emphatically stated. And then not only does he deny Jesus, and I think this is very interesting, it kind of fits with the way John tells his stories. Verse 18, Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. Uh, again, uh, I believe Jerusalem is about the same altitude as Denver, Colorado. I think it's about a mile high city. And so at any rate, it gets cool there. Uh, even in the springtime, in, in the evenings, at night. And so they had built a fire to stay uh, warm. And so we find Peter doing what? Going over to associate himself with those who are the enemies of Jesus Christ. Instead of standing with his brothers or standing with Jesus himself, he identifies with those who will uh, be persecuting uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see kind of a third phase. He's still... Uh, dealing with Annas. Annas is eventually going to send him to the son-in-law Caiaphas. But we find these questions here. The high priest begins to question Jesus. Now one thing about Jewish law is uh, there's a, a bit of a prohibition like in American law that uh, a criminal or an accused is not obligated to testify against himself. He's not, he, he has, the, as we hear on the police dramas, the right to remain silent. Okay, And so... Annas begins to interrogate Jesus. And Jesus responds in, in, in verse 20, I have been speaking very openly. I have been teaching the people publicly. If you want to indict me, it will be very easily to gather any number of witnesses to what I have said. They can testify to what I have been doing and what I'm saying. Why would you violate your own principles of jurisprudence by, by investigating and inquiring of me? Go ask those that can tell you exactly what I have said. There are many uh, volumes that have been produced on this, but uh, uh, usually they'll have a title like The Illegal Nature of the Trial of Jesus Christ. And there were a number of principles, according to Jewish law, that were broken as Jesus was railroaded from a human perspective to the cross at Calvary. Jesus says, I haven't been working in secret. I, I, I haven't been trying to do things in an underground manner. I have been very publicly engaged in my 
ministry. And so, one of the officers that was there at this time of interrogation, I, I think the right way of understanding it would be he slapped Jesus. That, and that's a very offensive way of striking somebody. When you slap somebody, that is, a, that is a, uh, as, as painful as it is, it's also very uh, derogatory. And so this, this soldier slaps, or this officer slaps. Now, probably that officer was a Jewish officer associated with the temple guard. Because my suspicion is a Roman soldier could have cared less. So there were two types of, of officers there that were involved in this the arrest. There were the civil authorities delegated uh, by the Romans, and then there were some temple guardsmen that were brought along uh, by the high priest and the, the associates of the high priest. And so this man is offended by the words of Jesus, and he slaps him, something I don't think a Roman soldier would have done, because he, he would have probably laughed, because again, they looked at these Jews in, in such a cynical and such a derogatory fashion that he would have probably found pleasure that Jesus Christ was uh, kind of uh, uh, evading or, or being, uh, uh, not being respectful uh, to this, uh, this high priest. And so, Jesus goes on to say in verse 23, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. Did he say anything wrong? He told the truth. I've been speaking in public. The way to go about trying me is to ask those that I taught. They can tell you everything that I have said. Then why do you strike me? Which was, again, against Jewish legal protocol. And so at that point, Annas sends him to Caiaphas, the son-in-law who is the acting high priest for that year. Again, we don't have the account in John's gospel, but all three of the synoptic gospels tell us about the interrogation that took place in the presence of Caiaphas. And again, it is here that we find Jesus making this great claim that he would appear in the clouds of glory, that he was the Son of Man, that he would be, be coming back in great authority and with great power. And again, their accusation is he is blasphemed. Now here's the thing. The Jewish charge is essentially, if you boil it down, that of blasphemy. He makes himself equal with God. The charge would be true if it were not true that Jesus Christ was indeed equal with God. He said the things that they're accusing him of saying. He never denies them. But yet, he is not guilty of these things because why? It is true. He is equal with the Heavenly Father. He is co-equal. He is co-eternal. He's co-glorious with uh, the Heavenly Father. And so Caiaphas uh, uh, quizzes and questions and interrogates. They abuse Jesus. And so they determined to send him to the civil authorities beginning with Pilate. Now John is not going to tell us about the, the, uh, the other civil trial, that before Herod. But we'll know before Jesus is crucified, he'll go to Pilate, then he'll go to Herod, then he'll go back to Pilate, who finally consents to the crucifixion being uh, carried out. And so, we see there beginning in, in verse 28, uh, they, they take him from uh, Caiaphas' house, and they go to Pilate's headquarters. And notice here their, their hypocrisy. They didn't want to go into the house, to Pilate's house, because he was a Gentile. They didn't want to be defiled by having contact with the Gentile. They didn't want to be defiled so they could not participate in the Passover. Here is the ultimate and the final, the effective Passover lamb right there in their, their presence. They are defiling him, but they do not want to be defiled. Again, just a reminder of the superficial nature of all external and false religions. And so, uh, they go and, and Pilate... Uh, comes outside to, to speak with them and begins to ask them, what is the accusation against this man? And their, their response, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. And Pilate is really not particularly interested at this point. If you've got a problem with this guy, if he's done something to violate the sanctity of the temple, if he's violated your laws, y'all go deal with him. Let me go back to bed. Just leave me alone. I, I really could 
care less about what's going on in this internal uh, Jewish matter. But these religious leaders, they insist that Pilate hear their case, that he pass judgment because the Romans, not only do they have the power to execute, but that they execute by means of hanging on a cross, which is the way it is prophesied that God's Son, the Messiah, would die. He would die hanging on a tree. And so John tells us that the reason that Pilate is given this part of the ordained path that this thing takes is it goes through Pilate's court so it would be fulfilled the manner in which Jesus would die. And so, uh, again, we're not told, but Jesus goes before Herod. And Pilate really, in doing this, is uh, simply uh, trying to, to gain some political capital, probably. He and Herod had been uh, having some friction. Herod was over the Galilean region. Uh, Pilate was over the Judean region, and they had kind of butted heads. And so we're told because Pilate thought enough to send Jesus to Herod, and Herod was kind of interested in this Jesus fellow, then they became friends from that day forward. They became partners in crime. And so, again, Pilate, again, takes up the case of the Lord Jesus Christ and asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' reply is, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Here's what Jesus is getting at. You're a civil authority. You're an agent of the Roman Empire. Have I done anything by, by, have you observed me do anything that is in any shape, form, or fashion a threat to Roman authority as it exists here in Palestine? Or are you just taking, believing this, this uh, uh, rumor mongering, these, these false indictments that these Jewish leaders that are so jaded by their own sense of power or you just believe in what they have told you? Have you even taken the time to consider the truth in this matter? Pilate's, Pilate was always very condescending toward the Jews. In fact, he typically stayed in trouble with them. He caused so much trouble uh, by defiling the temple precincts and offending their sensibilities that he, at one time he got called back to Rome and kind of in a real sense they said, listen, if you can't keep things straight in Palestine, we'll bring you home for good. And that won't be a pleasant thing for you, Pilate. So Pilate knew he had to appease these Jews because let me tell you something. A happy, occupied people are far more productive, therefore they pay a lot more in taxes than those that are constantly figuring out a way to create a rebellion or a revolt. And so again, part of the job of those sent by the Romans to keep the peace was you've got to keep people happy to some extent. Pilate had not been very good at that just because he was so cruel, so vicious, and so insensitive to the ways of the Jews. And so Pilate says, you know, hey, your, your people brought you to me. And Jesus, well, I think one of my favorite passages in all of this section here, verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews but my kingdom is not from the world. The origin of my authority, the origin of my power is not from this fallen order. It is from above. My kingdom is not really a threat to your kingdom, Pilate. They operate in two different spheres. And, and again, we, we can coexist, really, in some sense. I'm not here to establish a new government that supplants the government in, in place by Rome. I'm here to do something entirely different. I'm here to establish a kingdom that is going to transcend all earthly kingdoms and is actually going to survive far longer. All earthly kingdoms are ultimately temporal. They're transient. They're temporary. They will pass from the scene. But my kingdom shall endure forever. And so Pilate asked him, then, then you are a king. And Jesus says, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world. I came to this world to establish a kingdom. Yes, I did. I am the king of that kingdom, but it's a kingdom that you will never fathom. 
It's a kingdom that you will never see. You remember Jesus' words to Nicodemus? You can't even see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Pilate was not born again. This idea uh, that Jesus is presenting was foolishness to him. All people in all places in all times, if they do not have their hearts and minds and eyes open by the Spirit, consider the gospel as foolishness. They do not see this kingdom that is present, that is powerful, that, that will last forever. They cannot see it because it is not of this world. And so I came into this world to establish that kingdom, to secure the citizens of that kingdom by my death on the cross. That is what I have come for. I, have, I am establishing a kingdom of truth. To which Pilate replies, what is truth? That is one of the most enigmatic phrases to be found in Scripture. I think he was being cynical as though, you got truth, I got power. Which one's going to win this argument? I don't know. It's hard to know how to take that. But people have been asking that question since before that day and after that day. What is truth? And again, the ultimate truth is there is a man whose name was Jesus Christ. He was the Son of God. He came into this world and lived a perfect life. And he died on the cross so that we may have salvation, that it would be given to all who would believe in him. Well, the final thing that I want to look at this morning was, is the tragedy of Jesus' death. Again, Josh read a large portion of that. I'm not going to take the time to read it all. Uh, I guess it would be appropriate at this time. I can see uh, we're running a little bit short in, on time. I did notice this morning, and this is a bit of bad news, uh, that my clock went dead. My wristwatch is dead. It's 5 after 10 on my watch. But I do have uh, six-inch bright red letters over here that tells me that I've got about six minutes to bring this thing in for a landing. And so we're going to make, make an attempt uh, to do that. Again, Jesus is delivered over uh, to be crucified. It's the tragedy of his death. Uh, Pilate takes him upon this uh, interrogation, and he beats him. He flogs him. And, and really the attempt there is... Maybe, people, maybe their bloodthirst will be satisfied if I bring him back beaten to a pulp. And so he carries this out, he comes back, and he again asks Jesus, where are you from? And when uh, Jesus didn't answer that, but, but maybe he determines, hey, he's a Galilean. I'll send him over to Herod. Herod's in charge of Galilee. I, I, can, I can get this thing off my table. I can, get, I can send this to another court. Sounds like some of our courts today in the United States. Man, we're just going to send it somewhere else. We're going to send it to this court or that court. Well, that may have been what Pilate was trying to do. But Jesus didn't answer me. And then finally, as Pilate presses the issue, he makes sure Pilate understands this. Yes, you've got, an, you've got authority. But you wouldn't have this authority unless it was given to you from above. That you stand where you do, do, but as a part of the working out of God's plan in time and space and history. That all governments have in some sense been established by God. They will serve their time. And you, Pilate, and you, Roman Empire, and you, United States of America, you will pass from the scene one day. But my kingdom, it will stand. It will endure. And so... As Pilate tries to wiggle out from under this and, and pass the buck and see if he can find a way to appease people, these Jewish leaders indict him and they say that you're not Caesar's friend. That may have been a fairly technical term for those that always are loyal to Caesar. And because of Pilate's own weakness and his concern of having this authority taken from him, he capitulates, he gives in. He caves in to the pressure of the Jewish authority and he places Jesus on the cross the biblical accounts that we have of jesus death on the cross are fairly terse they're compact they don't go into a lot of details they don't tell us a whole lot about this method of execution but we know enough to know that it was an excruciating death it was a horrible death it was a painful death and it was the death that God had ordained that his son would endure. That This was the place and this was the point in time that, that his wrath would be placed on the son for the atonement, for the propitiation of the wrath of God. And so 
this treacherous act, this terrible act, this tragic act is carried out as Jesus is nailed to the cross. The interesting thing, it was not unusual for those that hung on the cross to, to live for even a couple of days uh, there on the cross in their agony. But Jesus dies when about, within about six hours. And it's just simply his reminder. I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. I lay it down to take it back up again. And so in the midst of his suffering and in the midst of his agony, he utters one final word. In the Greek, it is tetelestai. And that is a Greek perfect verb. Translated into English, it is finished. Three words. But the idea is it is an accomplished reality that has ongoing implications for the future. And so the work of the cross, the work of the atonement, the work of the propitiation of the wrath of God was accomplished in that time on the cross at Calvary. The gospel was secured. The bride was paid for in this work on the cross. It is finished. It is once and for all. That's why we do not sacrifice animals in our Christian worship service. There is no longer a need for sacrifice. Jesus Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, has made an effective, a permanent, and a final sacrifice for us. And so when they find that Jesus is dead, they pierce His side, and the blood pours out. We're told blood and water pours from the side of Jesus. And again, Anybody that would ever suggest that Jesus got off the cross alive simply doesn't know their science and they don't know their history. These Roman soldiers, their job was to make sure an individual was dead before they came off the cross. You didn't let somebody off alive because that meant your own life. Jesus was dead. We're told that ultimately he is buried in a borrowed tomb. That one of the inner council of the Jews, namely Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they come and they claim the body, and the, the ladies that are associated with Jesus, they come and they prepare the body for its burial. And so at the close of what sometimes we call Good Friday, Jesus is placed in a tomb, and a stone is rolled over that tomb to secure its entrance. And the work of Jesus Christ in atoning for sin, it is finished. Was it a tragedy? Was it a miscarriage of justice? We could even go so far as, is Jesus the greatest of all literary tragic heroes? The answer is no, not really. Not really. This was God's plan. Put in place and set in motion. To carry out that which he ordained that he would carry out. That the, that, that the world would be redeemed at the blood of his son. That, that evil would be highlighted that it would be tragic for them to abuse Jesus Christ. But yet, it would be God's plan to work out His salvation. It's interesting that kind of the Gospel of John and the life of ministry in Jesus is kind of, has two bookends. I, I caught it this morning as Josh was reading. The Gospel opens with John the Baptist speaking these words. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in the words of Pilate, Behold the man. After he had been flogged, he brings them to the people and presents them. He didn't know it, but indeed he wasn't just presenting a man. He was presenting the man that was the one that John the Baptist identified, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for this time. You have granted it to us. I pray that we have spent it well. That God, that you have used your truth to speak to the hearts of your people. That you have used your truth to penetrate the heart of those who are unbelieving. Lord, open their hearts. Open their eyes. Open their minds. Open their ears. So that they would believe and be saved. We thank you for your grace and your goodness. We thank you for what you've done for us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.